And welcome to this episode of the Good Citizen Podcast. Great to have on today, Sam Albury. Sam, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, thank you. It's good to be with you. And listeners aren't familiar with Sam. Uh, Sam has become, I, I think, a leading voice uh, in the church recently on just some very non-controversial issues. I was thinking about that this morning, <laughs> Sam. Like, you write on very non-controversial issues, things that people don't have any questions about at all. Uh, they written extensively. Um, several books on, Is God Anti-Gay? Why Bother with Church? Uh, Seven Myths About Singleness, and his most recent book, releasing here soon, uh, What God Has to Say About Our Bodies. Sam's a, a pastor, or he's, and he serves at Emmanuel Nashville. He's an apologist and also a speaker. And he, as you can tell from, from his voice, he, he may be from across the pond. Uh, so Sam, thanks so much for, for taking some time today. As we get started, I'd, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about your journey, kind of where you're serving now. Um, I, I often think in, in public life, it looks like fame is kind of an overnight success or you know, having a large platform is kind of an overnight success. My guess is that it's more like a, a lifelong attempt that finally kind of gets noticed. Uh, so I'd love to kind of hear your journey, uh, a little bit about where you're serving now. Yeah, so I've been in in some form of pastoral ministry for the, just under twenty years now, um, mostly serving at churches in the UK, and then over the last few years serving with an apologetics um, ministry, and that that role brought me across the pond here very frequently, and I'm now in the process of moving here. So, you mentioned Emmanuel Nashville. That the, the goal is for me to be based there. Uh, fully full-time and we're, we're in the process of applying for a visa um, by the time this goes out we will still be waiting for a visa and you know if some historian in decades in the future chances upon this podcast probably then we will still be waiting for a visa too it seems to take a, <laughs> a very very long time so I'm in I'm in Nashville as I speak right now but um, uh, won't be here for much longer simply because I don't have a visa and I can only be here for short periods of time And so what brought you to an interest in apologetics um, and even maybe a call into ministry? Yes, um, neither of those were, were kind of obvious directions to move in. I became a Christian when I was 18, and I'm very grateful for the Lord's timing on that. I was young enough not yet to have gotten into lots of things that I would now grieve as a believer. Hmm. But I was old enough that I can still remember what it feels like to be an unbelieving adult. And so, you know, as I hear sermons, as, as, I, as I write sermons, and as I look and think about Christian presentations to unbelievers and that kind of thing, I'm often listening with my pre-conversion ears and thinking, how would this have landed on me um, before I came to faith? Would, it, would I have found this compelling? Would there have been any traction? So I've never lost that, that side of things. So I'm, I'm often listening on behalf of either my pre-converted self or on behalf of you know friends or family who who wouldn't call themselves Christians now and thinking how would how would they hear what I'm saying so trying always to to think through what would what would someone say to this how would someone respond to this what would what wouldn't land what would land um I did a, an undergraduate degree in comparative religion and, and some of that degree touched on Kind of academic theology from a very secular point of view so again i was studying then in an in a context that was largely unsympathetic to christianity and i remember my walk to campus each day would, would be about a 30 minute walk i didn't have a car and i would spend that walk trying to think through what are the questions that are likely to come up in the in the lectures today and what might i say in response to them so even from my very early days as a Christian, I was having to think, I didn't know what apologetics was at that point, but I was having to think in terms of how to respond to questions and objections. So that that's always been part of my wiring. And then it was actually not long after I became a Christian that I, I felt called to, to become a pastor and a preacher. And that wasn't an obvious thing to do because I'd, I'd grown up with a significant fear of public speaking um so i wasn't like i was trending in that sort of direction anyway but i about six months after i became a christian my 
pastor did a short interview with me in front of the church. He would often do this just to hear people's stories. And he said to me after the service, I think you're going to be a preacher. Hmm. And as soon as he said that, I'd never even remotely considered that. But as soon as he said it, something in my spirit confirmed it. And I knew I would be hmm. um, and have been ever since. How did you go from England to the United States. So I imagine you had kind of a growing audience in, in England, but I was interested in how that kind of transferred over here and certainly recognize there are a lot of cultural similarities, um, what England's experiencing, what we're experiencing here. But I was just interested in that part of your story as well. Yeah, I've, I've been coming regularly to the States probably for about 15 plus years. Um, I've, I've had some very dear friends over here that I've often come over to visit. I've been a bit of an Americanophile um, for a long time anyway. So I've always been fascinated by American and enjoyed coming over here. And it's been really in the last five or more years that I was finding more and more opportunities and needs over here that seemed to be me shaped. Um, the sorts of things I was writing and speaking on there seemed to be a need for that kind of voice in the US church, perhaps even more than the UK church. Mm. So I was feeling over the last few years that the center of gravity of both ministry life and in many respects, personal life, that, that the center of gravity was gradually moving to, to this side of the Atlantic. So a, a little while ago, sort of made the decision to try to move here. Well, we're, we're glad to have you. <laughs> Grab well, for your I'm, voice I'm, church. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So as I mentioned towards the beginning, uh, you write on, you know, very non-controversial topics, but you know, uh, very important topics that the church is trying to work through. The point of this podcast is trying to develop a, a gospel-centered citizenship. And certainly this, the issue of the LGBTQ movement, the sexual revolution is hitting every congregation, regardless of you're in the holler or the high rise. But it's also very relevant in public life. Uh, the kind of the clash of the sexual revolution and religious liberty um, is something that I think all of us are aware of. We see it in the headlines. As I've been in this space for a time, I've come to realize that public theology or how, how you believe, what you believe about the Bible, what you believe about God, about the body, often very heavily influences public policy. And so I was interested in, in talking to you about specifically your most recent book, dealing with the body and talking to Christians, it seems like the T, the transgenderism um, movement has caught a lot of Christians unaware and they just find it strange. They don't know how to process it. They don't understand it. Had a chance to uh, be at one of your uh, breakouts at the Gospel Coalition conference on what the Bible says about the body. I thought it was extremely helpful. I kind of wanted to bring that to the audience today. So would you kind of jump into that? What, you know, what does God say about our bodies? Um, how can we think well about that? Yeah, it's a huge issue, obviously. Um, I think that the transgender thing has been fascinating. And, and you're right, it's, it's caught a lot of people unawares. Um, when, when the sort of discussions about same-sex marriage becoming legalized were going on, um, you know, that, that just seemed to to take, you know, to, to come through very quickly. And most, the vast majority of secular people were, were very positive about that. And the, the transgender movement came hot on the heels of that. It came sort of billing itself as the next thing. And as a part of the same continuum, in both cases, it was, a, it was built on the idea that how I feel myself to be is who I am. And if I feel myself to be someone who loves people of the same sex and that should be legally valid and recognized that was the argument we heard and then it seems a kind of a continuum with that to then extend that to gender identity interestingly there's been more secular resistance to the transgender lobby than there ever was to the the, the gay lobby um, and i think it's because transgenderism isn't simply well the, the nice gay couple down the road if they want to be legally married that doesn't affect the rest of us the transgender ideology deeply does affect the rest of us because it, it's redefining human ontology. Um, it's it's telling us that, that male and female don't really exist as biological categories or realities. So there's there's a if you like there's a bigger 
as a Christian, there's a bigger lie to swallow um, behind that. And even different parts of the secular world are, are resisting that. Um, and I think one of the, th the insights we get from the Bible is that, that gender identity, in as much as the Bible would even think in such terms, is biologically determined rather than being psychologically perceived. And so, you know, Genesis 1, male and female, he created them. He's, he's not talking there about creating someone's inner sense of who they are. He's talking about creating someone's body. So sex is biologically grounded in our account of creation and therefore masculinity and femininity are extra behavioral extrapolations of that biological foundation and reality rather than something we just feel or perceive within ourselves um, in, in different ways. So that, that puts us on, a, on an immediate collision course with much of where our culture's at. Um, and my, my concern, and one of the reasons for writing the book, is simply that I think we've we've underthought this area as Bible-believing Christians, and I think a lot of Christians are confused by these issues and don't quite know what to think or where to land or who's right. And we've lost touch with, with some of the basic and foundational things the Bible has to say about our bodies. You had a, a fantastic line, and I'm not sure if I, I wrote it down correctly, so uh, correct me if I, I don't get it quite right. But you were talking at the breakout session about how God's eternal plan for our lives includes our body, but that we have, I think you said we have new creation um, software running on old creation hardware. I thought that was a, a great thought if I got it correct. Um, it was that that was one of those thoughts that wasn't in my notes and as i was saying it i was saying i was thinking to myself i think that works but i'm i'm so it illiterate that i'm i'm nervous anytime i try and use any analogy that involves you know software well we'll leave that to the it people i suppose <laughs> it certainly worked for me and made a lot of of sense well uh, it's it's really trying to capture the fact that we we have already been made new in our spirit through the gospel, Paul says, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. Uh, we have a new self, a new heart. The old self is still around. And obviously, our, our bodies are yet to be renewed and, and yet to be redeemed. So hence that, that way of thinking that there's, there's a new heart within old flesh. Um, and, that, and therefore, there's that, that tension within each of us. Well, I wanted to jump into kind of what culture gets wrong about the body. But before we, we do, you, you had a couple of points that you brought out. And this, this may, uh, I don't want to take too much thunder from, from the book, but things like your, your body's not accidental. It's not incidental. Um, it's not straightforward. And it's, it's not yours. Um, so would you might, maybe just a couple of biblical truths that perhaps most Christians aren't thinking about very often when they think about their bodies? Yeah, I think that the first one is simply that, you know, the doctrine of creation means that our, our bodies are have been made for us by God. And I often come back to the account of, of how Adam was created. God took the dust of the ground. He formed the man from the dust of the ground. And then he breathed in that man the, the breath of life and Adam became alive. What didn't happen is God didn't create a soul called Adam mm. and then look around for a biological container to to shove it into <laughs> whereas we tend to think in our own sort of popular imagination and culturally that we are primarily souls and that the body is just a, a sort of arbitrary lump of flesh that our soul has found its way into which puts things i think the wrong way around um the, the bible speaks of us not as being enfleshed souls so much as it as it speaks of us being animated flesh um so I think the doctrine of creation, I mean, we're far more than our bodies. We're not simply flesh and blood, but we, we can't have a view of ourselves that doesn't take account of our flesh and blood. And our, our, bodies, our body is not everything about who we are, but our identity cannot be properly understood independent of the particular body that we have and that God meant for us to have. Um, David says of his fallen body in Psalm 139, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David understood himself to be fearfully and wonderfully made, even as a sinful human being. And that having been fearfully and wonderfully made was a cause of praise 
So we should be praising God for the way he's made us, even though for some people, especially that their bodies may be a, a cause of significant pain, they are still a means by which God is showing us his, his grace and kindness. I think that's probably the most significant thing in terms of as a Christian, our bodies now belonging to Jesus, as Paul says in first Corinthians six, again, that's, that's actually liberating news because we're always living for something and we're always living bodily for something. And yet what we find in, in Jesus is a far kinder master, if you like, a far kinder owner of our bodies than, than our culture is. Um, if, if Jesus is the one to whom our bodies ultimately belong, he is the one ultimately our bodies need to be pleasing to, and he's far easier to please than Madison Avenue fashion houses or, or Hollywood. So there's lots to celebrate there. Yeah. I was hoping that you were going to mention that because I, I found that very helpful. And even as I've, I've worked with students in the past who are always looking at what society says is the perfect mm -hmm. person, comparing themselves to that and being just a real issue in their lives of, of being dissatisfied of things that they can't change. Uh, so I love that thought that Jesus is the only one that has to approve of our bodies but then that also means that we're supposed to steward what God has given us. So there's that tension there. And you said something that was a bit convicting that um, what we put in our bodies is not, a, is not spiritually irrelevant. <laughs> so what we eat is not spiritually irrelevant. I thought that was helpful. Would you talk a little bit about stewardship for just a second? Yeah. So p part of um, honoring God with our bodies is, is looking after them. Um, Paul says in, in first, I think it's first Timothy that physical training is of some value, but godliness is of value for all things. So we must never make physical training ultimate. Um, but at the same time, Paul does say physical training is of some value. It's not of no value. Um, similarly in Ephesians five, when speaking about husbands looking after their wives, Paul talks about how we, we nurture and feed our bodies and care for them. Um, so there is a stewardship component there. We do need to, our bodies are not spiritually relevant. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about not so much what we eat in terms of, you know, calorie intake and nutrition and all those sorts of things. It does have a lot to say about what we eat because eating is a sign of fellowship and therefore who we eat with, who sometimes it's appropriate not to eat with. Um, what we eat is is relevant in terms of not wanting to cause other people to stumble and that kind of thing. But in a more broad sense, if, if we're meant to look after these bodies, then we, we should give thought to what we're eating and making sure we're not needlessly, you know, eating stuff that's going to be poor for our long-term health. I just never had thought of it perhaps in those terms or have, have really had, I guess, need <laughs> to sit down and think about what, well, what does God think about the body? So I found those those thoughts very helpful. What do you think secular culture gets wrong about the body? Uh, there's a there's a couple of significant ways, and these are these are contradictory. Um, in, in one sense, as I said earlier, we've we've got this new understanding of the self, whereby the self really is who I feel myself to be. My perception is the ultimate authority here, um, and my body is is not determinative of my identity in any way, shape or form. And so for many people, the body is simply the blank canvas on which I paint my real identity and often literally paint my real identity. It's not itself a clue to that identity. So I think in one sense, we've relativized the body um, because of that. In another sense, we've, we've also idolized the body. Um, we're, we're far more appearance conscious I think than we have been in the past. You, you you go into a typical, you know, see supermarket or, or pharmacy, that the men's grooming section um compared to 20 years ago is totally different. Um, you know, they, they we might have had a toothbrush and a hairbrush available to us and, and maybe <laughs> some deodorant if we were lucky, but there's so much more of a focus on on male grooming. And it's because we're far more image conscious. And I wonder if our image consciousness 
is related to the fact that we're having to image our own identity rather than our body already conveying it in and of its own accord. So we've, in one sense, we're body denying, but in another sense, we are um, far more concerned about what our body looks like and whether the image of our body matches the the sort of view of ourselves we're trying to project. That's helpful. And yet, yeah, so two harmful developments um, that contradict each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah so I think we've away- Id- we idolize our, phys- our physicality in one sense, um, but then we relativize it. And we, the biggest mistake I think is, is, is assuming that we can have an identity that is entirely inde- independent of our body. Um, I think I mentioned in that breakout, the movie Avatar and how, mm, yeah. you know, you can inhabit the body of an entirely different species in that movie and it not really affects who you are because who you are is simply the inner self that again can be, you can transfer the container for it without materially changing who you are. Or the thought of being able to just kind of download your consciousness into, you know, something and be eternal in that sense. Um, yeah. So that, that's very interesting. In your book, you kind of set out three categories, uh, what God intended for the body, creation, impact of sin on it, and how God will redeem it. Will you explain those just briefly? Yeah, so we, we need to, to, to see ourselves in that overarching story that the Bible gives us, uh, the story of, of all of humanity, and, and we're, we're created. We, need to, we really do need to understand that. Um, I think Christians have really under attended the doctrine of creation, Um, and I think particularly in such an anxious cultural moment, people need to know that they have actually been made by a God who intends for them to be here. Mm. Um, that the, the account of the the fall means that uh, our our bodies have been subjected to the same kind of frustration that we see Paul speaking about in Romans eight. And so our bodies don't work entirely the way they should. We get sick. We, we have all kinds of other issues with our bodies, um, and yet, uh, when when God comes to save us through through Christ, it's not just that He's saving our souls; He is saving the totality of who we are. And one day, our bodies will be resurrected. Paul talks about the redemption of our bodies being something that will will come in the new creation. And our eternal future is physical; it's not non physical. And I think a lot of Christians still labour under this impression that that eternal life will be some sort of vague floaty Hmm. kind of i'll just be a spirit somewhere and that that is not what the bible teaches us um i think we've been more informed by either renaissance art or episodes of the simpsons depending on our (laughs) cultural milieu but um (laughs) the bible speaks of a new creation and us having resurrected bodies again i found that just very helpful i've read the Bible pretty much my entire life, but just had not kind of put all of that together. I found it very helpful. I'm looking forward to seeing the book come out on that. So I wanted to switch gears now from kind of the, the theology of what does the Bible say about the body to how, how can we model these truths uh, to a culture that, as you've mentioned, has these, you know, two kind of conflicting errors, either you deny the fact that the body matters or you idolize it. So how can Christians model this? Yeah, we need to be people who embody the, the grace and truth of Jesus. The, the, the truth aspect of that means we, we can't simply be silent um, and passive. Uh, we do have a responsibility to defend the faith, to articulate the wisdom of God as we understand it, and to commend that. But the grace aspect of that means we we mustn't be demeaning we mustn't be belligerent um our battle is not against flesh and blood and when jesus saw the crowds and saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd he we're told he had compassion on them um he didn't get irritated by their lostness he had compassion on them and then began to teach them so i think our posture needs to be one of respect and humility and graciousness and our words need to be words of understanding but also of of clarity as we seek to commend scriptural truth and two therefore two obvious errors are either being 
nice but silent. Um, and on the other hand, being very vocal but but disrespectful. And I see both of those mistakes happening a lot in the in the church life today. I appreciate you saying that because that's what we're trying to navigate here uh, through the podcast, also our efforts in Indiana and around the country. Um, and that's a kind of a tension to be managed. And I d- certainly don't have all the answers, but I appreciate that. I want to talk now a little bit about the same-sex attraction issue. Um, I've, I've read an, a lot of your work on this, consider you, again, a leading voice on how we can respond to the LGBTQ movement with both grace and truth. And starting with one of the kind of theological questions or biblical questions that I even had a conversation with a pastor recently is this idea of a Christian maybe referring to himself, herself as a same-sex attracted Christian. I've studied this a good bit. I'm still working on it, but I think where I've landed thus far is that temptation itself is not a sin. But if somebody is identifying as a desire or a practice that's contrary to scripture, I can see where that could perhaps be problematic. Um, however, I know that the being sanctified, um, trying to kind of pull our desires back towards what Jesus longs for and, and, and loves is a lifelong endeavor. So could you help us think through that, um, kind of where you've landed and how yeah. kind of everyday Christian can think through that issue? Yeah, I think I'm in a similar place to you on that. Um, identity is, a, is such a significant part of where our culture is at on these issues. So you're sexual identity is your primary identity in in much of western culture and so if you're someone who um you know sexually attracted to people of the same sex and that becomes your primary understanding of yourself and of who you are it becomes a matter of ontology um and that that is a an unbiblical anthropology um it gives far too big a billing to our sexual feelings they're they're not insignificant they're they're a significant part of our humanness but they're not the key to understanding who we are and it's that one of the dangers therefore for christians as they sort of come to terms with whatever form of sexuality they experience is it is again we can make that a, a kind of category of identity and definition in a way that i just don't think is is biblically wise or proportionate um and certainly we should never take our identity from from something that is sinful um from something that is is part of our fallenness um because if we try and uphold christian ethics and christian behavior but have a sub-Christian or not even an unbiblical anthropology, there's going to be a very, that's going to be a very unstable compound. Because on one hand, we'll be trying to do what the Bible says, but on the other hand, we'll be thinking, but I am something that actually leads me away from what the Bible wants me to do. So I think we we do need to be more careful in, in how we think about our identity and the language we use and what we're preaching to ourselves by using that language. Um, so I, I, I'm not, I think it's it's concerning if Christians choose to make contemporary notions of sexual identity the way in which they define who they are. I think that's, even if they then say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian first and I'm gay second, I still feel that that's an unstable compound and, and not, not a wise approach to these things. That's helpful. And I, I suppose the the contrast to that would be treating, again, coming back to kind of a student ministry example of young individual that says I'm experiencing same-sex attraction and and treating that as kind of some sort of super sin rather than as part of the discipleship process and trying to bring our desires in line with what Jesus has taught. All Um, all of us are are sexual sinners. All of us are fallen in our sexuality. So the headline news isn't, oh, that Christian is wrestling with same-sex attraction. Um, because all, all of us wrestle with some kind of sexual temptation. Mm-hmm. Um, what type of sexual temptation you wrestle with is is not the main issue. The main issue is how, how is each of us responding to that temptation? That's very helpful. Um, 
in a 2020 talk, all right, so I'm kind of moving here from what we think of this individually now to kind of in the church, how you can have a 2020 talk on how churches um, can respond to their LGBTQ neighbors, um, those that would identify with that lifestyle, kind of give three marks of a church that's doing this well, clarity, mm -hmm. compassion, and community. Would you dig into that just a little bit to maybe the pastor that's listening, that's wrestling yeah. with this issue? How can they do that well? Yeah, each of those features is is essential. Um, clarity is obviously necessary. Ambiguity, silence, or confusion are pastorally unkind. Hmm. So people need to know what the Bible says. Uh, Christians need to know how to think about this. If, if we don't teach on these issues in the in the church, it's not that people are going to be untaught. It, it's that they're going to be exclusively taught by our culture hmm. and not by not discipled by the word. So we do need to have clarity. There are, there are some pastors who try to avoid ever talking about these things from a pulpit. I, I think that's, I think that's unwise. Um, so compassion is needed again, because um, all of us have, have fallen, all of us are ultimately in the same boat. Um, and therefore we, we mustn't be looking down on people simply because their sexual sin is of a different kind to that of the majority of our, our own particular church. Um, Jesus levels the playing ground on this. You know, all of us are, all of us are in the same boat on this. So there is a need for compassion there. Um, rather than, uh, I think that the danger is that we, we become more convicted of other people's sins than of our own. <laughs> and where you've got a, a situation in most churches where there's a minority sexual sin and a majority sexual sin, it will always be easier to make more of a fuss over the minority sexual sin mm. than of the majority one. And I, I see churches where, you know, gay people are, are routinely preached against, but adultery and sex before marriage seems to be okay. Mm. Um, so that's the compassion part. We just need to have a consistency there. Um, and then community is also essential because if you uphold, if you're calling on people to uphold the biblical sexual ethic, and that means for anyone who's not married, that they will need to remain single and celibate for as long as they're unmarried. Um, if you're not providing as a church, healthy forms of, of community and of appropriate intimacy and of deep relationship and family, you're putting a burden on people that they're, they're not going to be able to bear. And that was what Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for doing. And I see that happening in some churches where there's crystal clear clarity on what the Bible says, but where if you're not married and don't have a nuclear family of your own, you're, you're isolated. And that, that is not right either. That is a failure of orthopraxy. Um, so we, we need to make sure our understanding of the church as church is also being developed alongside our understanding of biblical sexual ethics. Um, otherwise, we will be preaching one part of the Bible and functionally denying another part of the Bible. And then, as you know, uh, Rebecca McLaughlin, who who is a, is a wonderful writer on these things i heard her say recently loneliness is the one form of suffering no christian should ever have to experience wow um and if we take the new testament seriously then as churches we we're meant to be blended families and therefore people who are are single because they're wanting to uphold what the bible teaches shouldn't feel on their own. Well, that is, that's so good. And I came brought to mind, um, Rosaria, Butter, Rosaria Butterfield's, uh, the gospel comes with a house key and kind of her, her story of coming to Christ through the community she experienced in a pastor's home. Yeah. That book is, yeah. is, is wonderful. And it will wreck with you in all the, the, the right kind of ways. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. You can't pick it up without being convicted for sure. Yeah. So now moving, and we've talked about kind of individual beliefs, the church and its gatherings. Now, as we kind of move out into public life, um, what I'm trying to study is how can we be 
gospel-centered citizens. How can we be citizens of, of heaven first, but then we live in a participatory democracy and want to love our neighbors well by participating. Um, I was just really blessed by that, that breakout event with Trevin Wax and Brett McCracken at the Gospel Coalition Conference and a number of the things that you shared there. So could you help us think through how the church should then kind of, in its public witness, uh, represent these truths, model these truths? Yeah, it would go back to what I was saying earlier about being people of grace and truth and, and not feeling that we choose one of those in favor of the other one. Um, so we, again, we don't want to be having a posture simply of, of anger and frustration as culture seems in many respects to be moving further and further away from a Christian understanding of these things. Um, it's not, it's not our right to be constantly kind of angry about that. And it's not going to win anyone. If, mm. if God's kindness leads us to repentance, then our anger isn't going to lead other people to repentance. Mm. Um, God is the one being sinned against, not us. And so he, it, his, it's his right to, to be angry if he chooses to be angry. It's not our right. Um, so I think we need a bit more humility than, than we've had in many parts of the church, even where we may be right and culture may be catastrophically wrong. That's never an excuse for, for kind of being demeaning or unpleasant or anything like that. Um, we, we actually need to be more loving than than the culture around us um we've got more reason to be because of our our understanding of who we are as people made in god's image so i i don't want to opt out of the public discourse i think as, as christians we have a responsibility to to commend truth that will be in the interest of our neighbors um if i if i'm to love my neighbor then i'll want policies that, that serve my neighbor and not harm my neighbor. But I don't think my participation is simply a matter of me insisting on, well, I believe the Bible and the Bible says this, therefore this is what everyone should do. Um, I think my responsibility as a Christian is to think, well, how can I commend God's ways and God's wisdom to a secular culture that doesn't believe the Bible, but in a way that would be meaningful to our secular culture? How can I try to show the wisdom of God on their terms. Mm. Um, that's not easy to do, but I, I, I believe that should be the, the sort of pattern that we we try to follow. Because if we simply say, well, this is the case because the Bible says so, our secular friends are rightly going to say, well, I don't believe the Bible, so why should I be interested in that? Um, so we need to try, I think, to to try and commend God's wisdom in ways that people can understand. So I want to I want to show what is the public good in understanding male and female as the Bible presents it, or understanding marriage as being the union of a man and a woman. Um, how can I persuade my non-Christian neighbour that these actually are going to be for the good of society? That's not easy, but I, that's what I'm trying to do anyway. It's very helpful, and my my wheels are spinning. And one of the a truths or one of the principles that I've, I've come to in my work, because uh, often Christians are criticized for, quote unquote, legislating their own morality. Certainly passing any law is the legislation of someone's morality, right? Yeah. But it's, it's that like you're selfish and you're just trying to push your, your views. But I believe if we're, we're promoting biblical principles based on the created order, and you talked about how we have not attended well to um, the doctrine of creation, but that Imago Dei, the fact that we're, we're all created in God's image, is actually the source of so many of the key parts of public life. For example, all people are created equal. Well, where does equality or justice, how do you source that if mm -hmm. not from a belief in creation? Um, even, you know, coming back to these, this sexual ethic, well, that comes back to God's good creation. And um, as you pointed out today, if you get away from that, you end up with these conflicting truth claims that smash right into each other. You know, the body's nothing, but we also idolize it. <laughs> yeah. um, and so that's what I'm, I'm trying to do, but I appreciate your, you can hear the apologist there in that last um, bit. And certainly we'll be thinking more along the lines of how can we communicate these truths 
to a secular culture that kind of puts them at arm's length. So those are all very helpful. Last couple of questions. Um, recently, if you had any kind of meaningful moments in your ministry, just a, a moment where you sense God was using you in a particular way. I, I have, thankfully. Um, I mean, I find particularly speaking on these kinds of issues because I think we've neglected them. And because I think, again, people are, are often within the church is seeing these false alternatives of you're either a, a jerk in the public square or you abdicate any kind of responsibility. I think just trying to present people a, a kind of Christian approach that is not silent, but is, is humble and gracious. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of traction from that. And we're speaking at a church in, in West Mississippi, uh, sorry, West Tennessee, <laughs> trying to figure out where I am. Um, and, and felt very much people really dialing into that mm. and wanting to have, there must be a way of believing what we believe in a way that is, is gracious to our friends and to our neighbors and not hectoring or aggressive. Um, so I was, I was grateful to, to sense God was using that, that time together. I'm just chuckling about the, the mental image of uh, someone with your accent speaking at a church in Western Mississippi or Western Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I tend to stick out. People always, when I'm being interviewed at churches in, in such places, the first question the pastor asks is, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> I'm going to say, no, I'm no, no. joke and say, no, I'm from Oregon or something. And <laughs> come clean. But um, yeah. Well, I, no, I'm grateful for, you know, God, we believe he places us in particular uh, places, gives us those life experiences. And if people will, you know, tune in and listen, just because of that, I, I'm grateful for it. It's such a needed message. So if, if you had a, a billboard on what you could put a message to the broader gospel preaching church, what would you put on it? Yeah, I've been trying to think this one through. Um, and there's a very good reason I'm not in professional advertising. Um I, if it was to the church, I'd want to say something like taste and see that the Lord is good. Mm. Um, I really believe that one of the things we've we've most lost sight of is the goodness of God. Uh, we've we think of God being right, and that's true, He is, but God's more than just right. He's more than just it, it he's more than just out correcting everybody. Um and particularly on these issues where there's a lot of cultural pressure to go in a different direction, people out there aren't going to care if what we say is true if they don't believe it's good. Mm. And actually Christians are not going to stay the course if they're simply doing it out of a sense of loyalty for what is right rather than they've tasted something of the goodness of God. Mm. So my, my challenge to pastors, especially when we're, we're talking about issues of human sexuality, is... Are, are people able to taste the goodness of Jesus in this area of life? Because if they're not, if they're not, here's my thing. If, if someone is biblically convinced about the, the sexual ethic, but they're not emotionally convinced, I don't think they're going to stay biblically convinced. Mm. Wow. And if Jesus is not more beautiful to us than the sins he's asking us to deny, we're not going to keep going with him. And I think in too many churches, we've, we've relied too heavily on just the threat of hell to try and scare people into obedience rather than people having a, a captivating vision of the beauty of Jesus. So I think the easiest way to get that on a billboard is, is simply taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you for that. That was powerful. Um, it's interesting. I, we had Brett McCracken on a few weeks ago mm. and he shared a similar concept about where does this go? And I was kind of joking about the biblical sexual ethic kind of being the problem child of the, the biblical family of doctrines. <laughs> like we don't bring him out very often, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's how it, it feels that most Christians approach the issue. And so having that emotional, um, spiritual belief that it is beautiful, that it is good and true, um, is something we kind of have to have for it to go forward. So yeah, thank you for that. That was beautiful. Well, Sam, thank you so much for taking some time with us today. I know that your, your new, new book will be launching um, later on this summer. 
So how can listeners get a copy of that and how can they follow you? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Um, the, the book is out, I think, in the end of June. Uh, it will be available in the usual sorts of places. Um, uh, it's called What God Has to Say About Our Bodies. So Amazon, other online places, and if there are still any bookstores around the place. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that should be easily available. Um, I, I do lots of writing in different places. Um, I, I do have a website of mine that I'm really bad at updating called Um But if you want to read more of my articles, then they're in places like Desiring God and Gospel Coalition and places like that. Well, Sam, we'll be praying for you. I'm just grateful that, that God has kind of, in a sense, raised you up to speak on these issues at this time. And again, thanks so much for taking some time with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.